I'm Director of the Behaviour and Health Research Unit at the University of Cambridge and that is funded as part of a Department of Health Policy Research Unit. So there are about 14 policy research units funded by the, through the Policy Research Programme um, at the Department of Health. And the purpose of the units is to generate evidence that has the potential to inform policy. So we are the Policy Research Unit on Behaviour and Health and the main focus of our work is on generating evidence on effective ways of changing behaviour across populations to improve health and also to reduce inequalities. I don't recall what first attracted me to psychology. Um, I suppose it, it, it is actually one of the most popular undergraduate subjects, so I suppose the question is why did I stay in psychology? Um, and immediately after my first degree I read a second degree in abnormal psychology and trained as a clinical psychologist and did that for a few years and realised then that actually my interests were much more in research. Over the last 10, 15 years, the focus of my research was very much on trying to understand how people responded to biomarker risk information, so feedback about personal risk information, um, particularly focused on genetic risk information, wanting to understand how people responded and in particular whether or not receiving this personalised risk information was an effective way of motivating people to change their behaviour. Um, I conducted quite a few experiments in that area, uh, as well as working with others to conduct a systematic literature review. And the brief answer to the question, does feedback of biomarker risk information change behaviour, is probably not. So that is a fascinating finding in and of itself. Um, but what it particularly led me to um, think is, well, given that behaviours are now um, the main sources of non-communicable disease, what are effective ways of changing behaviour if feeding back personalised information isn't? And this has really taken me right back to my first degree in social psychology where some of the most compelling findings, particularly at that time, were the findings from Milgram and the other social psychologists who were working immediately after the Second World War to try to understand man's inhumanity to man. And what those experiments, which are now very familiar to not just undergraduates but also the general population, what those experiments really told us was that context is a very powerful, has a very powerful influence on people's behaviour, often to the neglect of people's values. So thinking about people's health-related behaviour, um, while people, most people value health very highly, and many people have a goal of improving their health and everyday behaviour. In fact, it seems that the environment is playing a much stronger role than they uh, imagine. So it's in that area that my current research is focused. The biggest challenge in public health today, I would say, is the fact that the main vectors of disease in the 21st century are legal products which are highly profitable and extremely attractive. So that's tobacco, alcohol and processed foods. Now that combination of characteristics being highly profitable as well as being highly attractive to people means that any attempt to reduce consumption meets with a high level of resistance. And I think that this poses 
very big questions for, or very big challenges rather, for policy makers and raises questions beyond psychology really into political philosophy and um, macroeconomics about um, first of all what's the role of a politician is it to lead or is it to to follow the other challenge as i mentioned concerns the economics of this that i think that there there is an inherent tension between creating wealth and creating health I think as psychologists we have to be pretty humble about what we know about how to change behaviour. So looking over the last 30 to 50 years, uh, there's been a lot of research by psychologists and indeed others aimed at trying to change people's health related behaviour. And I think at best we've had pretty modest success, particularly using the models that highlight conscious or reflective processes. So the kinds of interventions I'm thinking about are those that are aimed at increasing people's knowledge, providing information, persuasive information, um, trying to make people more aware of the threat that they face from continuing to engage in particular behaviours, as well as the benefits of, of changing those behaviours. So the fact that those have had, as I say, um, a best modest effect in changing behaviour, particularly um, achieving sustained changes in behaviour, has led people to look for other models. And I think over the last few years, there's increasing interest in expanding models to look not just at conscious processes but to look at models, particularly dual process models, that encompass both non-conscious as well as conscious processes. And indeed this is going back to the roots of psychology. William James at the end of the 19th century highlighted how the majority of our behaviour is actually um, controlled, shaped by non-conscious processes. So psychology is rediscovering its roots, if you like, by focusing on this. And indeed, if we look at how our environments have changed over the last 30 or 40 years, um, these, uh, these changes in the environment are um, closely mirror the changes in our behaviour. So just thinking about food, the ready, ready availability of uh, increasingly appealing foods, um, uh, stimulating the environment, advertising, which uh, are strongly associated with increased consumption of these foods. So, being much, uh, so focusing much more on these, the environments, um, provides a way in for thinking about how to change behaviour or to ensure that behaviour that might be changed initially by a focus on conscious processes might be sustained. I think the role of psychology in the future of public health is huge, or at least potentially huge. When we look at the main sources of premature death um, and uh, uh, Ill, Ill health, um, uh, disability before before dying, then these are largely explained through people's behaviour, um, the four key sets of behaviour, so consumption of tobacco, excessive consumption of alcohol, excessive consumption of processed foods and physical inactivity, um, explaining between them uh, uh, over 60% of deaths worldwide and particularly importantly, those behaviours are socially patterned, so explain a significant amount of the difference in life expectancy and a uh, number of years lived um, in good health between those who are richest and those who are poorest. So the potential for, for psychology to contribute, and obviously not on its own, is absolutely huge. There's been um, 
quite a lot of interest since the publication of the book Nudge in 2008, both in the UK and in the US in particular, about the potential for using um, Nudge, or as we prefer to call them, choice architecture interventions to alter people's behaviour. And I think it's, um, it's, it's un unrealised uh, potential, but how much potential we don't know because we don't have the evidence yet that's been assimilated to know what kind of effect size can be expected. So I'm hopeful that certainly changing various cues in the environment um, will have the potential to, to change behaviour. Um, what we don't know is which particular aspects of the environment, singly and in combination, are going to be most effective. For instance, what, uh, what's the impact of removing cues for unhealthy behaviours versus introducing cues for healthier behaviours? My impression is that there seems more enthusiasm for introducing cues for healthier behaviours than there is for removing cues for unhealthy behaviours. And we don't actually know whether or not introducing cues for healthier behaviours without removing the cues for less healthy behaviours is having the desired effect at all. So certainly uh, it, it, it does have the potential for changing behaviour partly because it's targeting non-conscious processes, which are processes that um, shape most of our behaviour, um, particularly the, the health-related behaviours that explain um, much of ill health. There's an added interest for thinking about choice architecture interventions, which is their potential for reducing the social patterning of behaviour. And two characteristics of choice architecture interventions uh, would feed into that. So the first is choice architecture involves changing aspects of the environment. And we know that those who uh, um, are most deprived are more exposed to environments or environmental cues for less healthy behaviours. So by removing those, one removes the likelihood that um, those who are more deprived will engage in less healthy behaviours. Secondly, there are reasons to believe that by changing environmental cues, the behaviour that results is less dependent on executive control or brain um, uh, control mechanisms for, for, for behaviour. And there's a growing evidence base to show that early environments can un undermine executive function, um, the ability to control behaviour in certain situations. So by intervening in a way that doesn't depend on that particular cognitive resource, which is less abundant in more deprived populations, again, that's a reason why choice architecture interventions have the potential to contribute to reducing the health inequalities that arise from the social patterning of behaviour. Now that's an untested hypothesis, but I think it's a very important hypothesis to test. We'd say, well, first of all, I, I feel spoilt for choice in terms of what I could choose from. Um, but reflecting the fact that research, the kind of research that, that I do, is a team effort, I would say that probably the study that I'm most proud of is the one that I remember colleagues describing as brave, um, in that it was a, um, a, a very difficult trial to, to undertake, and we pulled it off if you like. Um, so the trial was focused on screening for haemoglobinopathies in pregnancy and it was, it was a trial that involved a research team, probably the largest research team I've ever worked with. So I pulled together a team of 30 people 
um, involving almost a complete seaside zoo of population health scientists in terms of statisticians, psychologists, um, geneticists, GPs and others. And one of the reasons why I, I feel really proud of it was that it was a study that involved training GPs in deprived inner city practices to present a genetic screening test to pregnant women as part of a routine consultation. And there's a general view uh, abroad that, well, GPs, you know, they, they're saying that you can't engage them in research and just trying to teach them anything is sort of hopeless. And what it taught me was, well, they, they were incredibly engaged and regardless of what the trial showed, and in fact it did, did show that the, um, the intervention did achieve the, hy the hypothesi hypothesised effect, which was that um, pregnant women were being offered the test earlier in pregnancy. What it also showed for me was that GPs, if you've got a good question, and this was a question which went to the heart of inequalities, then they, they will engage. And so I was really proud to be part of a great research team and a great clinical team who implemented uh, a novel intervention. So if I weren't working in psychology, um, so this is, I'm, I'm taking this as a, a, a complete fantasy question, um, what I would likely be doing, imagining tens of thousands of hours more practice, um, is touring the world with my piano trio. I play the cello and uh, we would be playing through Haydn's very fine repertoire, underappreciated. So I'd be doing that. Or, um, more recently, I've become attracted to sailing, and so maybe I would be part of an all-women's team um, sailing competitively across the oceans.